My name is Tom Evans. Um, I have been a photographer in Yosemite for about 20 years. Before that, I climbed El Capitan several times myself, so I know what climbing is about, big wall climbing. Um, these days, I not only photograph climbers every day uh, during the spring and fall climbing seasons, but I also write a blog every night. And in the blog, I have uh, my 10 or 15 best pictures of the day and pictures that will explain what various teams are doing. So I write about who's climbing what, how well they're doing. If they're doing pretty well, I give them an attaboy. If they're not doing so well, I poke a little fun at them and uh, try to have a picture of every team uh, within uh, two or three days uh, when they're actually climbing. So um, I've been doing that now. Uh, my blog is like seven years I've been doing the blog. I've been doing the report longer than that, but I did it on another, in another medium. Big wall climbing has sort of drifted into the backwater. Well, with the El Cap report and all the photographs, I put probably five or 600 photographs a year doing their reports so people can see all these different climbs. I'd never seen the nipple pitch on Zodiac or anything, but now you can actually see that pitch on the El Cap report. So the things they dream about, they can see and they can read about climbers who are climbing them and they can quickly realize, wow, those guys aren't any better than I am. I can do that. And then that makes the dream happen for them. Yeah, um, the bridge, the whole bridge thing sort of started back in the late 90s. I uh, would just come here and photograph and hang out and a few climbers, a few of my good friends would come and we'd sit around and watch the rock. And then climbers started coming up and saying, well, what's going on in El Cap? What, who's on what? And so I got so tired of telling everybody over and over again who was doing what that um, I decided to set up some telescopes and they could, I could just say, oh, well, look in the telescope, you'll see the people on this and that. And that drew more and more people and pretty soon not only were climbers hanging around, but tourists came around to hang around and see what was going on. And so the bridge, that whole bridge thing, sort of around the turn of the century started to become uh, an important part of the community, the climbing community. People started coming to the bridge and I started commenting more and more and having more and more photos. And, and so it was a gathering place for the community. And uh, nowadays I have, we have people who come, I had a climber the other day come from Switzerland. Uh, he said, oh, I've come from Switzerland. I said, well, you gonna climb something? No, I just wanted to stand at the bridge and see the bridge and El Capitan. And so he came all the way from Switzerland to be able to see the bridge. So the bridge has gotten, through my blog and other, other people's writings, a lot of publicity. And so this little humble bridge behind me is one of the icons of American rock climbing right now. When you say, oh, we were at the bridge, there's nobody questions what bridge. It's this bridge, the El Cap Bridge. We call it the, the epicenter of the center of the universe because El, El Capitan, for us, is the center of the climbing universe and the bridge is the center of that culture. An, another important aspect of the bridge is that climbers who don't have a partner, perhaps, or need information about El Capitan can come to the bridge and find other people that have the same interests they do. Great climbers can meet other great climbers for the first time. I was talking to Hans Florin after Yuji decided to stop doing nose record climbs. And I said, you know, you ought to, you ought to hook up with this guy, Honnell, Alex Honnell. He might be really good for you. And so then I went over and I talked to Honnell a couple of days later. I said, you know, you ought to hook up with Hans Florin. You guys could really get that nose record down to a really incredible time. A week later, Hans and Honnell are climbing on the nose for the record. So. And everybody's very friendly at the bridge. Even, like, in some areas, famous climbers, they're so elite that they don't bother to talk to the regular climbers, right? But here, on any given day, you'll see Alex Honnell sitting up on a railing or Hans Florin uh, just talking to everybody. And some people don't know these people by sight. So you see some climbers you are talking to some of the greatest climbers in the world, and they have no idea. They're just climbers. And that's kind of what we like to promote, a, a sort of an equal society among peers, you know. So, so you can get it, root information. You can, get, you can make, meet a partner. You can just see famous people that you've always wondered about in their, in their natural environment, not up on a stage where they're acting. Well, the, the thing about the bridge is everybody, there are famous people who come to the bridge, but they're not held in such great awe that you just stand back and look at them. They will talk to you, they'll talk to anybody. Uh, funny, I got a photograph two years ago, a tourist drove up and stopped and rolled down the window, 
how do you get to Bridal Veil Fall from here, right? And it had a, our sign, the Ask a Climber program. And so Alex Honnold and Hans Florin step off the curb and are telling these people how to get to the various places. The people have no idea they're mega famous climbers and they're just doing a regular service like anybody else would. They're just regular guys. Oh yeah, we can help you with that. One of the things about the LCAP report that I didn't really realize was going to happen when I started it, I just basically started it for local news, for local people to check. And I thought, boy, if someday the whole sum of my efforts could amount to a thousand, P, a thousand hits on my little site, that'd be so cool. Well, I get 2,000 hits a day now. And basically what happens is Billy and Bob are going to go climb Sea of Dreams or whatever climb they're going to do. And they say, oh, mom and dad and girlfriend or husband or wife, whatever, uh, check the El Cap report every day and that you'll see how we're doing. And so I constantly get emails from mothers and fathers and loved ones saying, oh, thank you so much for putting out this report. You know, I thought climbing was kind of crazy, but it looks like it's not a not it's pretty reasonable activity. You have people climbing all the time. They're happy. They're doing well. And we can track our son. And if we are lucky enough that he makes the report a picture, then it, it's very important to them. So I get a lot of uh, responses from parents thanking me for having the report in the first place. Because if, if your son is, uh, if you're in England and your son's climbing the Sea of Dreams like Andy Kirkpatrick is right now, you can read my commentary and know Andy's doing pretty good. He's not tearing it up right now, but it's early in the climb and he looks good and he looks strong. And, and I'm saying, well, Andy's, Andy's going good. And everybody at home says, oh yeah, Andy's going good. They're not imagining. You know, like, oh, Andy's in a faraway country and he's climbing this big rock and oh, rock climbing must be really dangerous. No, you see the picture of Andy and, and you, you read the commentary of a knowledgeable person. So we get a lot of that on the report now. I'm, I'm really happy for that. That's one of the reasons I've kept doing it. For me though, the best thing is coming to the bridge and seeing people I haven't seen. It's that first day of the season, everybody comes out and you get to see all your old friends and these are real friends. These people, I am an old man now, I turned 71 today, and so a 23-year-old climber normally wouldn't relate to a 71-year-old person. You don't see a lot of mixing of generations, but here it's a different thing. It's like I'm sort of the senior friend of everybody, and I try to be everybody's friend. And so they, if they, have it, if they need advice about something on, the, on climbs, I'm pretty knowledgeable. I can tell them how to do this, what not to do. They come to me sort of like they would come to a father or a grandfather. So I feel really proud of these people. Like when somebody comes up and does a great climb beyond what I thought they could do, they come to the bridge. The first day back, you're back on the bridge after a great climb, you're, it's your glory day. You get to tell your story to everybody, we hand you beers, we pat you on the back, you're the man for the day. If you bail, however, you get about a week of crap from everybody. So that's another incentive to succeed. You don't want to come down to the bridge with your bag on, with your head bowed, doing the walk of shame. You want to come there, so you'll try a little bit harder. You'll, you know, you want to, you want to impress the gang. There's a whole crew of bridge rats who hang around, and we're watching everybody who climbs. It's a big family, really. Well, as a rock climber, first of all, the, the title of El Capitan uh, that makes it really well known is it's the largest granite monolith in the world. It's the largest single piece of rock, granite rock, that you can climb. And fortunately, it's 10 minutes from the road. There are great climbs all over the world that are maybe even better climbing than El Cap, but they're in the back in Pakistan where it takes you two weeks to get in there and you're isolated. Here you can come, climb in a good, uh, decent climate for climbing. There's no big huge storms or at rock avalanches and stuff that wipe people out on a yearly basis. So it's pretty safe climbing. Um, it also is the, the home of the technical history of rock climbing. All of the techniques that are used now on all the big walls around the world were invented here on El Capitan, right from Warren Harding on up. So it has a place in the history of the sport and a route like the nose route up there it has such a, it's such a great line and it's composed of such great pitches that climbers from all over the world want to come and climb that. Uh, I've seen cases where guys would come and climb El Capitan, the nose route, and they would, that was, that was the height of their climbing career. They would come back and they'd say, you know, we're done. This is, we've realized a dream. 
And then we have the regular guys who are here, local guys you might call, they'll climb it eight, ten times a season. So if you want to climb a lot, ten minutes from the road. If you want to climb one of the great climbs in the world, you can get here. The logistics are simple and you can climb this great rock. And there's many different kinds of climbs on it. There's free climbing, there's hard aid climbing, there's middle style or middle level aid climbing. There's no really easy free climbing, but if you're at a higher level in the sport, you want to free climb. That's a big tick on everybody's list. I free climbed El Capitan. That's an, that's an elite group of people. Big wall climbing is, um, it's sort of a dream at first. You, you, you basically start out at the lower level of climbing. When I started out, we would, there wasn't much media back in the 60s when I started climbing. So if you could, see, if you could just see maybe once a month, two or three pictures of somebody climbing El Capitan, you poured over those pictures. You, you took them out and you looked at them constantly. Oh, look at that. Man, imagine me being in that spot. That would be so cool. When I first climbed El Capitan in 1971, it was the 33rd ascent of the nose route, we used 52, 55 pins we took with us. Sort of as a joke, I like to say, they say, did you ever climb El Cap? And I said, yeah, I climbed it when it was hard. <laughs> because hammering pins and taking them out is brutally hard, but it's terrible for the rock. So I'm pleased every time something new comes out that instead of beating on the rock, you can put in something that's safe and quick and doesn't damage the rock. So there's been a big evolution in, in climbing completely. Well, generally the first time, it you're frightened pretty good. Um, the dream doesn't really change. It just becomes a reality instead of a dream. And the, the reality is always different than a dream you have, right? So the reality is, I like to say, climbing El Capitan is 90% hard physical labor and 10% fun. And the fun is when you're back at the bridge having a beer talking about it. So that's kind of what I like to say to the guys. One always wonders what their place in the history of things they're interested in is going to be. And so I, when I first started out, it was sort of a local thing. And then I began to realize that, um, well, one of, my, one of the young climbers that I was talking to one time, he said, yeah, I, was, I came here 10 years ago. And, and, I, and I heard about you being there at the bridge. And I heard that you were the judge, the jury, and the executioner of everything that happened on El Capitan, right? And so it turns out that I, I have had a tremendous impact on the sport of wall climbing because I try to do it in a lighthearted manner. But for a time, people would, for some reason, take these extendable sticks with hooks on them and skip some of the aid placements just to go faster or to be they didn't want to do that hook move so they would take a stick out and use it a thing we call a cheater stick because it amounts to cheating when you're actually if you're an aid climber the sport is placing the gear well if you stop, stop placing gear then you stop being part of the sport you've cheated so nowadays it's extremely rare, rare to see a cheater stick because I would put the guy's photograph on the El Cap report and say stick of the day and then suddenly this guy shows up with a stick well he never used a stick again and so other people realize wow if I use a stick and cheat Tom's gonna get a picture of me and put it on the internet and so we laugh about it everybody laughs it's not serious but it's enough to change the style of climbing right and that's one of the things I wanted to do another thing I wanted to do was have people be more efficient and take better care of the rock instead of pounding in a pin anytime that you had a doubt try a couple different kinds of placements so um, as far as I as far as I think now I've had a great influence on rock climbing on El Capitan and as a result since the media now is so all-inclusive and everywhere it's had a standard it changed some of the standards around the world of what is expected of climbers I'm not happy about the press that extreme kind of it's not just extreme, but it's it's something that you wouldn't want your son to do. You know, you wouldn't say, oh, Johnny, I'd like you to become a free solo. And you don't want that. So since we have this great equipment that now works so well and is so strong and safe, I'd like to see people use it more. You know? Although the solo business is very small, very small number of people actually solo. But those are the people that we see getting killed. And so that really bothers me a lot. I, I get very attached to these people, uh, El Cap climbers, 
and some people say, wow, somebody was killed, oh, too bad, and they, it bothers me, I, it, I, it grinds on my emotions. And in the last several years, we've had a lot of people killed, more than, more than for 15 years before when I was here. So we've had more deaths, there's more people, and so there's more likely, you know, statistically, there's more likely to be a fatal accident than there used to be. I used to tell tourists that the, they would say, oh, those climbers are up there, it's so dangerous. I would tell them, hey, it's more dangerous for you to drive home than it is for them to climb because they're generally experts for El Capitan. And so any idiot can kill you on a highway, but you have to be a highly trained idiot to be killed up there, right? So um, it's, it's not as safe as I'd like it to be anymore. But it's, it could be safe if people would use the equipment properly. And we do get climbers who want to climb El Cap. And they don't want to pay their dues. They don't want to do the leaning tower, the Washington Column, and build up to it. And then when they get on El Cap, they do really well. They say, oh, we've got this new gear. There's El Cap. Topo doesn't look too hard. Let's go do it. And we still have a 50% rate of failure on El Cap. Half the people that go up there don't make it to the top. Within the first day or so, down they come. Gee, we didn't, we weren't climbing very fast. Or couldn't move the bags. They're so big. It's another problem. When I first climbed it, we hardly took any, any, we had one small bag and that was it. Don't come here thinking that you're going to climb the nose because it's only C1. The logistics on the nose are what beats people on the nose. I've never seen anybody come down because they couldn't make the next placement. It's not technical. It's all the traverses and hauling the bag and arranging the belays. That stuff is the stuff you learn on easier, shorter climbs. So the nose is not, people say, oh yeah, that's an easy climb. Technically it's an easy climb, but it's a hard climb for your first climb. Part of, my, part of what I do here is whenever there's a rescue off of El Capitan, I stop what I'm doing and I photograph using all my various techniques and equipment, the entire rescue. Who, you know, with a camera, I give, I give, one of the things I do is I give the photos to the park service, you know, just free, gratis. So they can then use the photographs and the time timeline that's on every photograph to figure out what they're doing, where they could improve, various other rescue techniques they could be using. And usually the members who are involved in some kind of a tragedy will come to me or I'll get to talk to them very soon after the event and we'll discuss what happened and then I'll write it up in the report and we'll talk about it at the bridge. Well, what happened? People will come up. What happened to that guy on the nose and, and you discuss it with them and say well what what did he do well he should have done this he should have done that and then you then I write something well okay folks the lesson here is don't do this or don't do that so remember that we don't want this to happen again so it's sort of like an airplane accident once once a plane crashes they find out exactly what happened and they correct things so it'll never happen again well we analyze rescues we talk about them we would like to have people become so aware that that type of accident will never happen again.